And thank you all. Uh, the items of interest from the school committee. Um, I have one, Mr. Crane. Um, it was brought to our attention um, that our DECA program um, is facing some issues with the upcoming state competition that's taking place in Boston, um, I believe in March. Um, as everyone knows, there's currently a vaccination mandate in the city of Boston. So we have a number of students um, who are not vaccinated who um, will not be able to partake in the state competition, um, even though they'll be able to partake in the country, the national competition in Georgia. Um, I believe that we've tried to make inroads with DECA. We're not getting anywhere, so I was actually curious, perhaps maybe Sally, we can talk closely about, is there anything that you can help us with um, in terms of how we can work to get these students able to participate um, in the DECA program. Knowing right now that there is that vaccination mandate in Boston, there is no educational exemption that's being made for these students. Um, I believe it was announced that for our athletes who are partaking in the um, playoffs in Boston, there is an exemption for them. <laughs> so it's kind of confusing why our DECA students wouldn't be able to get an exemption, but our athletes would be able to. So that would be something that you and I could possibly talk about further, about if there's anything that you can help us with to um, help these students take part in the, the state. You know, I think all these kids want to do is just, <laughs> they did a lot of hard work this past year and they want to be able to participate as, as a team and as a group. Okay, perfect. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, anyone else on the school committee? I do uh, just want to mention to uh, my colleagues that uh, we'll probably be having an executive session before the February 14th meeting to, um, we'll have two items. One will be to uh, discuss and potentially, although we'll take a public vote, the uh, contracts, temporary contracts for the acting superintendents. And the uh, second item is that we need to appoint a representative. That won't be in the executive session, but we'll need to appoint uh, one of our superintendents or acting superintendents as a representative to the consortium. So uh, just that'll be upcoming and you'll see that on the next agenda. Uh, all right, are there items of interest from the community? Mr. Smith. If you have love in your heart, please listen. If you have love for your children, please listen. If you are not suffering from cognitive dissonance or criminal malfeasance, please listen. Who benefits from children wearing masks in school? Who benefits from people stuck at home, unable to go to work or school, church or travel? Who benefits from nonstop testing and case counts? Who benefits from a captive audience, literally captive to mandates and lockdowns? Who benefits from a clinical trial that lasted two months on an investigative new drug by a company that is a convicted felon for safety violations and false reports in previous clinical trials. No independent review and zero transparency. Why do the pharmaceutical corporations have immunity from harms and liabilities given to them by the government, but human beings can't have natural immunity given to us by God? How is it that the FDA and CDC jointly run vaccine adverse event reporting system lists 22,193 deaths from COVID-19 injections through January 14th, 2022, but we are told they are safe. They said they were safe. 22,193 healthy human beings dead. They said they were safe. But their own study submitted to the FDA last February 
lists thousands of serious adverse events reported, including blood clots, myocarditis, life-threatening autoimmune diseases, neurological injuries, reproductive fertility problems, cancer, and death. The document states information on efficacy is lacking in all categories. They know it damages the immune system, weakening the body's natural ability to fight off infection. The infections stir up a cytokine, the injections stir up a cytokine storm for nine weeks. Then your immune system crashes like a hard drive. So they see, they say you need a booster. How many boosters? Is this a subscription for therapeutics for life? Did people consent to this? They know it causes blood clots all over the body. Clots in the brain are leading to strokes. Clots in the heart are leading to heart attacks. So bad, in fact, the FDA had to approve a blood thinner for children last year, a blood thinner for children. They added tromethamine to the injections to mask heart damage. They know these injections are not safe for pregnant mothers. Pfizer's own data shows 91% of the mothers receiving the injection in the first trimester lost a child. VIRS show over 3,600 spontaneous abortions and miscarriages after injection. They know it inhibits DNA repair. These injections are not safe for human use, and repeat doses only increase the toxicity. Sloan Kittering reported the injections weaken the body's ability to suppress cancer. According to data from the UK Health Security Agency, it's likely continued injections are driving the infections, not protecting the population, causing antibody-dependent enhancement, vaccine-enhanced disease, and pathogenic priming. Not safe for human use. They said they were effective. Normally, a new vaccine takes 10 to 15 years to develop. A recent study in Israel at Sheba Medical Hospital tested a fourth dose on 150 healthcare providers. It found no protection against infection. These injections create an immune response to a pathogenic protein, a protein our body is instructed to make, hijacking the software of life. This protein causes illness in the body, and our bodies are making them. That's not a vaccine, it's a Trojan horse, as our body's immune system will attack the cells producing the synthetic spike protein. These injections have been called vaccines. That is a fraudulent label designed to mislead people. They are, in fact, cellular gene therapy, and if people were given the true informed consent regarding risk-benefit, 95% of the planet would have said, hell no. Not giving true informed consent to human subjects violates the Nuremberg Code, medical ethics, federal law, and human rights. This is a deceptive product marketing. This is deceptive product marketing. This is a criminal malfeasance. This is human exploitation. This is genocide, and it must stop. I submit this document, which lists over 1,000 studies demonstrating the harms these products cause, cause in human use. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask you to listen. These gene-manipulating biological products do not prevent infection, they do not prevent transmission, and they are causing serious short-term and unknown long-term damage in healthy human beings. I appreciate the time. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Please. So I just want to read the study from Sloan um, Kittering study. I, my qualifications, I'm a chemical engineer. I work in biomedical industry. I do not represent my employer or any type of pharmaceutical company, but the conclusion was very clear that chemotherapy itself is not associated with any worse outcomes, nor was COVID-19. It was very clear sentence there with cancer patients. Um, it's clear that people interpret these studies without fully understanding statistics and the conclusions that are able to be made with that. And I understand that there's a heightened awareness um, and sensitivity around COVID and vaccines, um, but there are qualifications that come along with these studies and interpreting these studies, and they're very sensitive about the conclusions that they make, and they try not to jump to conclusion. What happens is people read these studies, and then they jump to a conclusion, which is not stated by the data. And so it is very important that we be careful with our words, especially in a public arena like this, so that we don't promote misinformation by improperly concluding um, the conclusion of the actual study. Thank you. Sorry, had to do my scientific no. duty. I take it over. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. Um, yeah, it, I, <clears throat> let me say this. Um, we make it, um, we 
make our forum available to anybody who wants to share their opinion. Um, we're not going to turn it into a debate in a back and forth. We're just not. Um, but every month, you know, our items of interest from the community allow anyone to basically stand up and give their opinion. I think that, um, let me put it to you this way. Mr. Smith has a particular position which he expresses pretty much every month. Um, and that's fine. As long as he keeps showing up, he's still going to get some time at the microphone, as will anybody else. Um, having said that, I think even he would agree that his, um, his position does not necessarily reflect conventional medical wisdom, let's say that. Now, I tend to be one personally who um, tends to respect conventional medical wisdom, and I think that uh, the best people to listen to are the ones who spend a, live, a life learning how to interpret um, data and uh, studied communicable disease, et cetera. But my real suggestion is that um, when it comes down to vaccinations and whether people should get vaccinated, um, I'm gonna suggest that you don't listen to me and you don't listen necessarily to Mr. Smith or to Mr. Starmus or anybody else. Um, my suggestion is that to the extent that you have a physician who you trust, most of us have family physicians who we trust the health of our family to and the health of ourselves. And if you trust your own family physician, then take the time to talk to your physician about questions that you might have about whether being vaccinated is the proper step for you or your family. And uh, you know, things that we see on the internet or things that, as I say, I'm no expert on this. Um, so I would say, and I hope people will, when it comes to the health of them and their family in terms of COVID, talk to your doctor and uh, you know, do some of your own research, et cetera, but um, get good advice from the people who take care of your family already. That's all I will say. All right, <clears throat> we are moving on to an update from our state legislator. Sally Kearns is here. Joan Lovely could not attend tonight. She ended up with a uh, scheduling conflict, as I think often happens to senators and our legislators. But we're very glad to have Sally here. And uh, I've asked Sally to kind of give us an update as to what's uh, going on on the Hill. Hi that there. would be of interest to us to answer a few questions from us and uh, time allowing, answer a few questions from the audience. Good evening, um, Sally, and thank you very much for being here. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I don't, some of, many people here I've not met, I think, or I don't recognize you. So I'm Sally Kearns. I'm our state representative, um, along with the awesome Senator Joan Lovely, who, yes, is, um, you know, she's on the Rules Committee. She's in Senate leadership. She's the chair of the Women's Caucus. She's got a lot going on, so we couldn't make it jointly, and she was nice enough to say, you go, and I'll catch up in February. So I appreciate the chance to come and share a little bit um, about what's going on at the state level. Um, before I forget, I think it's Alice Campbell who asked about DECA, and an, I guess you, what you're looking for is help asking for an exemption from the city of Boston vaccine mandate? Yes. And so these are kids who can't get vaccinated? Um, they just are not vaccinated right now. Because they don't want to be or because Correct. they can't be? It's parents' decision not to vaccinate these children, so they're not vaccinated currently. Yeah, so that's, you know, when we, when we choose a certain path, we, we accept that there are things that go along with it. So um, you and I can have that conversation afterwards. Excuse me. I'm, I'm, <laughs> Where would, I'm sorry. Are, Stop it, sir. No more. Everybody, we're going to show respect. We're going to treat the representatives with respect. We're going to treat each other with respect. This is not going to turn into an argument. It's all right. Thank you. It's all right. Um, so we, yes, let's, we can maybe connect afterwards. I don't know that there's anything that the state legislature can do, but let's have a conversation. I'm happy to do that. I have cards with me. 
Um, uh, actually, Sally P. Kearns, uh, no, sorry, that's my personal. Sally.kearns at mahouse.gov, email me, um, or I'll get yours and we can, or my number. Perfect. So, um, most recently, uh, first of all, I just, how do I do this? This is right my way. I'm just going to go like that. Um, first, I wanted to say to our principals, our teachers, our building personnel, everybody, teachers especially, our school nurses, hooray, uh, for hanging in there over these past 22 months, the longest 22 months in memory. It's been rough, and I appreciate, and I think most of the community does as well, how hard everyone has worked, and the patience, I know, I'm sure you all saw the story about um, the student at a Worcester High School and talking about what it was like, you know, just hour to hour. Do I, do I show up late for class because I don't want to walk in the crowded hallway? Do I, um, you know, get, do I get tested the second I get the close contact information? Very trying. Uh, I thought it was eye-opening to read it from the perspective of a student. Um, and um, I'm sure you all know, as, as I do, I have several friends who've had Omicron. It's not mild or for them. Or for a couple of them it was, and others said they just felt like a truck had run over them. So, and we are still in a surge. The numbers are coming down, and that's great. So I just, you know, by way of saying thank you, um, just wanted to note that you've all done a tremendous job. Um, so last week, the House passed a $55 million package that will um, expand, set up and expand some testing. It will provide um, funding for the, for the masks, and it's going to come through the schools. I know that this is probably information that you all know, Keith and Mary, if you haven't yet. And I know as well that the shifting guidelines have been very difficult. And, I just want to acknowledge it. I mean, the, the governor and his team are doing the best they can do. Um, I haven't always agreed, but I, you know, we're here at, at the 22-month mark, and things are looking like they might be more manageable very soon. Though I would love to hear from your perspective if you feel very differently, if you wish that the state was doing something differently. You know, have at it. Um, do you? <laughs> Anybody want to? OK. Or email me as you think about it. Um, so that legislation, is it, it's um, on its way to the governor, I think. I think the Senate's going to do it this week. And you know, for whether you agree with it or not, Governor Baker's approach has been test and vaccinate, because that's the best protection against the virus, um, respectfully. Um, that's the best way to prevent transmission of this virus. So um, testing, boosting, um, vaccinating, more testing, more testing. So I hope that that will prove to be workable for all of you as you try to get through this. Um, uh, in December, uh, the House did the, uh, it, the state's share of ARPA funding. It's very very dense. It's a very well-crafted plan. It's going to have funding for uh, a reserve account for additional funding for um, what is it, compensatory services for special ed, uh, $10 million for grants to address workforce challenges in approved special education schools, um, $10 million to support programs focused on creating a more diverse educator workforce. And I know that that's something that um, when I was on the Human Rights and Inclusion Committee, we talked a lot about with um, actually all of you. So um, that's, that's very encouraging. There'll also be um, uh, grants to public school districts on the facilities side. I know that here the town does the facilities. Um, uh, and then there'll also be um, grants uh, to create a pediatric behavioral health urgent care program model uh, and $115,000 for one pilot uh, to address implications of COVID-19 
uh, on children's mental health. And I am sure, I don't have to tell any of you that the effects are, you know, they're, they're quite pronounced in some cases. Um, so, um, and then we also, I just want to shift gears because I could stand here forever and I, it's, you've got enough going on. Um, um, you know about the rapid test going home. Is there any light you need me to shed on that? I'm assuming you have just as much information as I do. We're going to okay. talk about, about that, actually, uh, one of our next agenda items. Yeah, about how that will work, um, the rapid test coming home and um, uh, replacing the test and stay. So um, I'm going to shift gears. We passed as well in November, um, we passed and the governor signed uh, legislation requiring that we teach genocide and that we've talked about this a lot uh, at the Human Rights and Inclusion Committee so it was nice that um, you know things happened and um, the Education Committee reported that bill out and uh, now we will have um, a full you know requirement that the Holocaust uh, is horrible and evil as it was we just saw we just saw the other day why w this is so necessary uh, yet another attack on a house of worship a religious house of worship um, based in hate based in um, religious intolerance uh, intolerance so um, the striking remark that I took away from that debate on that bill it wasn't really a debate uh, of Excuse me, there was a debate. There was. Um, there was a fellow who opposed it and spoke against it. Um, but the sponsor of it, a guy named Jeff Roy, who's from Franklin, Massachusetts, talked about their research showing that um, a significant number of millennials weren't sure that they had ever heard about the Holocaust. And that just brought me up short. So, we very much need to be teaching about our history, the painful parts of history, and, and we have to be very accurate in how we teach it. And um, so I, I think that that's a good step forward. Um, and then we've also coming, let me see, um, the Healthy Youth Act has had some forward motion um, and it came out of um, the Education Committee, and I think it is still, oh, and it came out of Ways and Means as well. So the proponents of that bill have been at it for a long time. It doesn't require the teaching of um, sex education, but it does require that if you're going to do it, it must be age appropriate, and it must be, um, it has to be medically accurate, and age appropriate, and it has to inc have inclusive information and resources about gender identity and sexual orientation in an age appropriate fashion, of course. So um, we'll see where that one goes. Um, I know that you're probably all, probably some mixed feelings on the mask mandate going until February 28th, and then they'll reassess if you're at 80% vaccination rate, you can apply for a waiver, and um, some have done that. Um, I don't think, you know, we're, we're not at 80 percent. Um, and by the way, my other shout out is bravo to the Danvers Board of Health for voting in a, an indoor mask mandate. I think that, you know, our, I think that we're doing the right things, and um, I think our town deserves a pat on the back. And we still do have, you know, 28,000 kids. Um, and another 4,700 staff in schools who have COVID. So, but we're getting there. Um, happy to take any questions. Um, Let me start with the, the uh, committee and, and uh, yeah. go right down the line. So, Mr. Starr. I'm all set. Thank you. Any more question here? You all set up? I think I'm all set. Thank you. Good. Thank you. All right. I do want to. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the vocational schools and admission um, admission process and uh, we have a, a separate issue sort of happening in Danvers where there's a uh, the numbers of Danvers students that are being accepted 
is disproportionate compared to our actual portion of the district, if I'm making that clear enough. And uh, it therefore results on any given year, a, it can be a real budget hit because uh, there's really no, there's no limit unless we decide to put a limit on it. Of course, we're, we don't necessarily want to do that, but there are also issues relating to the fact that, um, you know, our vocational schools taking the right students based on their admission, you know, process. So I don't know if you have any comments on that, Sally. I do. Um, I'm, I'm involved in some of these discussions as well. Um, uh, in fact, had a meeting fairly recently. Senator Lovely convened it with um, uh, the superintendent at the tech, and where we said, this is what we're dealing with. Uh, we have a $500,000 increase in our budget every year um, over the past three or four years, I think, uh, strictly due to increased enrollments at the tech. Now, earlier, when I first was back in the legislature, um, I signed on to a letter to um, Commissioner Riley saying, look, you know, basing admissions on attendance and grades for vocational school students is not equitable. It's not a good measure of how a student, will, I mean, I'm sure you you deal with middle school before you dealt with high school kids. I mean, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so it's kind of, it's inequitable uh, because there could be a kid who would be a great fit at a vocational school and maybe they are struggling and they hate school and uh, for whatever reason. So we ask that those criteria be changed and they didn't. Um, they didn't do that. They, what they did say was, well, we'll give some, we, we, we want districts to show us what their criteria are. Um, so that's one part of it. And then the other part of it is just flat out numbers where we're, we are 9% of the population of the Essex text tech district and we're 17 percent of the seats so is that fair is it fair that you know uh, one town because it happens to be the town hosting the school um, far more many students go there than really is fair if you base it on proportion of population um, and I, I think that it's a hard it's a hard question, you know, the, the Vogue School, uh, you know, Heidi Riccio says, well, you know, kids have a right to uh, a technical education, and mm -hmm. yes, they do. Um, but we have to have some acknowledgement that there is some shared uh, responsibility. There is, you know, only so many seats. That just is a fact right now. And, you know, even if we could, if we could build another one overnight, it, which is unrealistic, at some point you do need to say, well, what's the equitable way of doing mm -hmm. this? How do you apportion those seats in a way that is fair to families, fair to kids? And then, of course, you get to the whole discussion of, um, you know, when a kid goes to the tech and we know, they know that they intend to pursue a four-year college program, is it right to ask, could they have gotten that same co college program prep at Danvers High School? And I, I think that, you know, these are not unfair questions. I think we do have to be realistic. We have to be willing to say, is that really the education that you want? Could you get that education at the high school? Um, and I, I think that to some degree, you know, you might have kids who choose a school based on many reasons. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's part of it too. Um, at, at minimum, what I'm looking for is at least an acknowledgement that this budget issue was very real. It's a half a million dollars every year. Yeah. Our, our assessment is going up a lot. And so if you lay on top of that, if there's, you know, if there are kids in, I don't know, uh, Gloucester, anywhere, and they aren't able to get in, and we've got all of these seats, you know, I think we have to look at it. So I'm going to be working with Joan 
and looking at um, the, some of it is the VOC funding formula. It also has this weird twist with the Aggie. Mm. It will always be the Aggie to me. <laughs> uh, um, because it's the only ag opportunity. So if you live in Revere and you would like to go to the tech, if you, you would like an agricultural based education, that's where you can get it. Mm. And so that's a factor. So we have to find a way to deal with this, I guess is what I'm saying. And I, it's not gonna be perfect. I, I don't think, I know that the town requested uh, of the tech, could we please limit our enrollments? And I think they got a no. So we want to see if we can do a little bit better than that, kind yeah. of work with us here and at least figure out, um, you know, is there additional state funding available to provide, you know, ed to provide some help, but mm -hmm. you still have that limited number. And then what percentage should, you know, should one community get? Uh, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> well aware of that one. Um, yeah. yeah. I think we want to be um, obviously we want to be partners with the uh, Essex Tech, and, yeah. and uh, we want to see the the right kids get the education they need from you know Danvers High School or the Tech, whatever is appropriate. And so, some dialogue about how to accomplish that together would probably be a good thing. So, we appreciate you uh, looking into that, Sally. Yeah, no, I am, and I'm happy to do it. And, um, you know, aren't we lucky? Kind of a nice problem to have, you know, yeah. all these nice opportunities right around us. But, um, right. yeah, so um, we'll continue that conversation. So would you be willing to take a few questions from the yeah, audience yeah, yeah. if sure. anyone has mm -hmm. some? Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can sit. That's okay. Well, you should probably go to the microphone so that... <sighs> People with town can hear. Maybe Sally. Maybe uh, I'm sorry. So I'm going to have you just sort of ask your question as uh, no, it's directly short. as you no, can. No, it's short. It's short. I, I nothing prepared. Um, I appreciate those comments. Uh, I am a student of history myself. I have spoken about the Holocaust uh, in the past at school committee meetings, and I would like to say that uh, segregation is the first step towards genocide in a society. That is historical fact. And when you start to segregate society and say like vaccinated can only go to certain functions like the DECA program, unvaccinated are not welcome in Boston, that's a slippery slope with segregation. And the, my other comment is I very much commend history and the teaching of the Holocaust because it was a crime against humanity. So I support that. Uh, I, I wonder if you find any problem with out of the Holocaust, out of World War II, out of those atrocities of the concentration camps, the crimes against human beings, came the Nuremberg Code. And the Nuremberg Code, number one principle, is informed consent for any medical experiment on a human subject. <clears throat> so the masking at 80% for vaccination is coercion, according to the Nuremberg Code. Not allowing people to go to student events because they're not vaccinated is punitive and it's in inducement. Those are contrary to the Nuremberg Code. That's what we learned after World War II. Thank you. Thank you. The idea that someone would equate I know. the Holocaust with a policy to protect public health is disgusting. I should probably be more restrained, but it's offensive. Well, actually, and that's relevant because in 1933, the Nuremberg laws were passed. Eric, do you have any yeah, other questions for me? I find this very manipulative and I won't participate in it. I, I again I am really This is one of the problems that, would, that what is basically yeah. a public health issue is becoming over politicized and this is what we get. Are there additional questions, please, for Sally if you have them? Do you have a question?
Well, <clears throat> here's how I look at this. No, it isn't. Uh, I'm just giving you some context. So I had to have a measles shot, mm -hmm. measles, mumps, rubella. I know someone who had polio. I had a polio shot. So would I support vaccination to go to first grade? I mean, that's what we all had. You know, it's 50 years later, and so the processes are, you know, faster. And I'm not an epidemiologist. Or yeah. I don't know that you are. I won't, I won't purport to try to delve into the... Of course you do. Of course you do. I think all parents love their children and care for them and want to protect them, and this has been hard. I, I, that I will grant you. I grant you that there would be some worry. But will I support, um, you know, when they're at the appropriate time? I can see that at an appropriate time, after vetting and after assurances from the CDC and from knowledgeable people whom I trust, and I happen to think that there are some very qualified, I think, some very qualified people that work on this, and I could see yes. Yes. Does that answer your question? All right. If there are no more questions, I'm going to let the representative go. Thank you so much for taking the time, Thank you Sal. all. Stay healthy. Hang we, in there. Thank, thank you. you. We appreciate having you here. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Can we, why don't you go to the microphone, please? That's all right. It's just we're. So, Mr. Green, I thought this. public comment. To... We can't be. You know, it's not like a question and answer to the committee. So, I don't really. Well, it was just a question that Alice had asked, and I found some answers for her, and I just wanted to share it. That was all. Oop. Regarding the uh, DECA student who wanted to participate out in Boston, a question was asked: Does this policy apply to schools or school programs? And the answer is no. The policy excludes public and non-public schools, pre-kindergarten pre through grade 12 school trips, school programs, child care programs, and community centers. Students participating in school trips to covered establishments such as museums or school-sponsored athletic events are not required to show their vaccination status. And if you'd like, Alice, I can send you the link to that page too, okay? That Thank you. because it does contradict what our students are being told. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So let's um, move on on the agenda. Um, next item is the HRIC Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. event. You got it. Okay, good. All right. Um, I, student representatives are not here. All right. So let's move on to uh, COVID statistics and next steps. So, well, there are six weeks worth of data. Um, so I'm just going to provide some summary data as we go through it. But we'll remind everybody of what our health and safety measures are as we continue to um, try to mitigate as much as we can while the students are in school. Mary, if you go to the next slide, so you'll see we'll start on December 17th. You'll see that we had 166 cases townwide, with 17 of them in the school setting, with a positivity rate of 7.39%. So this was kind of at the beginning of the surge that we saw in Danvers. If we go to the next slide, you'll see on December 24th for that week, cases rose to 223 cases with 20 cases in the school setting and a 7.45% positivity rate. The following week, December 31st, this is where we see a big jump. Um, the next two weeks worth of data, you'll notice, notice our in-school cases are lower due to the winter break, but we had 459 cases townwide, 17 in the school setting, and a positivity rate of 8.3%. For the week of 1-7, there was 494 cases with 52 in the school setting and a positivity rate of 13.77%. And then the week of 1-14, you'll see that there was 421 cases with 141 in the schools. So you'll notice that we've, we've passed the peak in cases townwide, 
but this is the week that we see the peak in cases in the school, just due to that being a full week um, of kids being back with a positivity rate of 17.8%. And then for last week, we had 337 cases with 82 cases in the school or a positivity rate of 17.66%. So obviously we did see a large increase that went with the increase in town. We're hopeful as we see state numbers continue to decrease that we continue to see that same decrease in the schools. Um, I would also like to extend my thanks to the building administration and the nurses um, for really taking this on and dealing with the contact tracing and, and everything that came with this, including staffing shortages to make sure that our students could come to school every day. Um, so thank you to all of them and thank you to our families for really keeping kids home when they were sick and being a partner in this work with us. So now we will look at some of our vaccination data. We're gonna look at this from 1216, and then we're gonna jump to the most recent data. So to look at what the changes were over the course of a month, I'm gonna have everybody focus on the bottom right corner, um, which shows that our vaccination rates in 12 to 15 year olds was 56%, and 16 to 19 year olds was 66%. If we go to the next slide, we'll see over the course of a month, that data went up to 61% vaccinated in 12 to 15 year olds and 69% in 16 to 19 year olds. So we still do have students getting vaccinated and those percentages increasing. As we've discussed in the past, the um, option to remove masks when you hit the 80% threshold is based on local data collection um, and not based on the information that comes from the state that we showed in the previous slide. So you'll see we did see increases in most of our schools over the course of, again, that six week time period from when we collected data. Um, we are not near 80% at any of our schools still at this time, and we'll continue to collect that data and ask families to share that if they're willing to with their school nurse or their building school principal. Um, so that way we continue to track our growth in the vaccination rates. Next, we're gonna, if I can pause there for our normal statistics, if we have any questions real quick, and then we'll jump into the new testing options that the state has. Does anybody have any questions on the data? Nope. Okay, so when it comes to the new testing option um, through the Department of Education and Mass DPH, this is being recommended by them. It is moving to weekly at-home antigen tests for all interested staff and families. So it is a voluntary opt-in program. Um, we would be asking that everybody complete their tests on Wednesdays, that's after meeting with our nurses and, and really talking about when they think the best day would be and based on what exposures are and then the time that it takes for people to develop symptoms. Um, we decided that Wednesdays would be our day. Um, staff and families would continue to report positive tests to the school. The district would continue to report those positive cases to DESE. Positive tests would not be reported to the Mass Department of Public Health. Right now, no rapid antigen test is reported to them when PCRs are completed. Those are reported through DPH, but rapid tests are not required to. Um, it is a similar model to which Connecticut and Vermont have implemented already. Um, and the model would be where we would send home a box of two tests with every student and staff member who opted in every other week, so you'd get your two tests that would carry you through two weeks. With implementing this program, it does mean that we would pause and discontinue our contact tracing, which we'll get into a little bit when we get into our next two slides. Um, as I said, it is voluntary participation. There would be an opt-in form required. Um, if parents do not opt in at the first round, they can always opt in in the future and get into that next cycle. So it would be in an every other week cycle that you could opt in as they start the program. Um, the test would be distributed by district staff in conjunction with CIC, which is the testing company that has been assisting us from the beginning with the test and stay program. So again, this is based on research and evidence from the CDC in the state of Massachusetts. So they are showing that the test and stay positivity rates in school are less than 2% um, positivity. Similar rates have been seen in California and Illinois. So to me, this is showing that the mitigation strategies that we have in place are preventing the spread of COVID-19. So the idea is by doing these rapid antigen tests, we may be finding asymptomatic individuals or other individuals before they come to the school setting and hopefully identifying more cases prior to them coming to school. 
For our local Danvers data, you'll see that we've ran approximately 4,425 tests and state tests to date, with 37 of those being positive, or a 0.84% positivity rate. So our positivity rate is even lower than the state average right now. And then we are doing symptomatic testing currently, and we would continue to do symptomatic testing in this new program. And you'll see of those, there was 46 with positive results with a positivity rate of 18.18%. So those would continue to be run in this program. Um, so essentially, test and stay would be discontinued, but symptomatic testing would continue and it would be a voluntary opt-in program for all staff and families. Let's go to the next. Um, and this is kind of a summary, but as I said, the discontinuation of the test and stay program, discontinuation of contact tracing, we would have the ability to contact trace if a medical expert found it was necessary. So let's say we discovered that we had three students who all sat at lunch that became positive. Our nurses would have the option to implement contact tracing at that point to try to identify other individuals that may be at risk, even though we wouldn't do it on a regular basis. Symptomatic testing continues. Um, we would need to check in with the local board of health, which we have done, um, and they discussed that at their meeting last Thursday in a draft form. Um, Dr. McLaughlin and the rest of the board were in support of the program and um, did not have any reservations about that. We've also checked in with our school nurses who are also all in support of the program as well. We do have Suda Benedictus here to represent the nurses um, if you should have any questions from that medical end, but they are in support of it. Um, and then the new test option and the current model, so whether we stayed in test and stay or went to this new model, the Department of Education has told us this will be in place at least through April 22nd, okay. but has made no guarantee for any testing program beyond that date. Um, the original opt-in timeline was last Friday if we wanted to get in to start this week. We did not opt-in at that time. We wanted to wait until after this meeting to opt-in if, if that's the direction that we go in. Um, it is the recommendation of administration that we adopt this model going forward. We would begin with students next week and staff on February 7th. To start, it is on alternating weeks. So staff tests are delivered if we had signed up by Friday this week, student tests are delivered the next week and alternate back and forth. Um, so staff would start a week later. And the, um, all test and stay and contact tracing would be in place through that week of the 31st when those tests are distributed and we start our formal process. Okay, thank you, Keith. So, um, any, let's I guess start with questions. Jeff, do you have any questions on the uh, change that is being proposed by the state and that uh, the administration is recommending? Oh, no, no questions, thank you. Um, Mr. Cabrera, if we were to adopt this, when do we have to, because um, I know families have to, you know, agree to do it, when would, we, when would families need to respond to, to be able to start January 31st? Um, so we would be sending out a communication on Wednesday with details of how to opt in, asking families to sign up by Friday to get into okay. the first round. So they should be checking their email and if they want it like as soon as possible with those. Yes, so okay. how we usually do our superintendent's weekly update, this would be the focus of the weekly update with information to share again about the program and with all of the opt-in forms would come out Wednesday afternoon. Okay, um, and then just, I mean, I think that if the, you know, the nurses, they're the medical experts, if the professionals, they're dealing with this every day, if they recommend this, I mean, I don't see a problem with it. I think that we do what they think is best. Um, just a few questions, or a question that came up with a few parents. If we were no, no longer doing contact tracing, which obviously we wouldn't if we adopted this, my, I know it's harder at the um, high school and maybe the middle school, you know, but as far as the elementary, or even just, I guess, I don't know, Nursey, I might have to put you on the spot. Do we still try to, when possible, um, space when possible? So yeah, yes, guess. all of our mitigation strategies okay. that have made us successful to date okay. would stay in place going okay. forward because that's what's allowed the, okay. the in-school transmission rates to remain so low. Okay. So, so we would have in place all the same strategies. No more test and stay, no more contact tracing, everything else pretty much stays the same. Yes, we're still okay. going to keep them in cohorts at lunch and in classrooms okay. and those different pieces to, to minimize that. All right, thank you. Um. I agree with Robin. I think that this is going to be a program that will be welcomed for families um, in town. I just had a question. Um, if families don't opt in, what happens? Nothing? 
Nothing. That's okay. their their right. That's and if they decide in two <clears throat> weeks they want to opt in, they can, and they'll get into that next cycle. Okay. Um, you mentioned the contact tracing at lunch. So will those students then just be told to take a test at home versus quarantining automatically, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. I just wanted to make sure of that. All right. Um, that's all. That's all I have my questions. Thank you. Martha, um, I don't have any questions, but Sue, since you're here, can you just tell us from the nurse's perspective why you think this is a good thing? Hi. <laughs> Sue DeBenedictus. I'm <clears throat> the school nurse at Danvers High School. Um, all nine school nurses here in town are very excited about moving forward with this new testing program. Um, I want you to be reassured, the parents to be reassured that if we see a situation or hear of a situation of close contacts, we can follow up with that, make sure that the children feel well. If they don't feel well, it's up to our discretion to give them a test, whether they are vaccinated or not vaccinated. So that's what's really wonderful. With the shortage of tests that everybody has at home and the difficulty getting PCRs, this is another good option um, that you will be getting two tests every other week. If you don't need to use that test one week, that's fine. If you feel that your child is ill in the morning and you want to use the test, go ahead and use the test. That might help you decide if you should keep them home or, or send them. Do they have, you know, based on the test? Um, or if they have been with some family members or friends over the weekend, and you know that they've been a close contact, they've had a sleepover, they've had a party, they've been out hanging out with their friends, and it comes Sunday night and they're not feeling great, you have a test in which you can give it to them. So we fully support it, all nine school nurses. So we also did talk with Thank all you. of our union leadership, um, and they were also on board with the new program. So we did check in with each of them as well. Okay. Um, anything else? Uh, no, I'm good, thanks. I, uh, we did check in with, uh, uh, with our attorneys, we don't have to take a vote on this. This is a decision that the administration can make. I don't hear any serious objections here. And so I would say it's your call and uh, you know, do what you feel is appropriate and we'll support you. Unless you want us to take a vote, we're happy. Nope, I think we're just looking for consensus from the committee. Okay. So thank you. Great. All right, so the thank, next thank item. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate it. I'm we do sorry. just have one last piece under COVID. Oh, so yes, we do please. have quickly to share um, Absolutely. a new draft COVID dashboard that we've been developing. So we'll be from our weekly statistics to an interactive um, dashboard that would be available on our website at all times that parents could access live information. Um, so you'll see I'm just going to kind of work from kind of the, the top left. We'll let it <laughs> refresh for a second. So obviously the students and tests and stay in that top left would, would go away now as we move models, but we would show mm -hmm. the total cases. The default view would be over the last week. You'll see the number of cases in each school. You'll see that there's a, a bar graph that shows the number of cases by grade level. And then below that is the total number of students in a percentage basis. So if you have 20 kids and there's 300 in the grade level will show you the percentage of the kids that are currently positive. The top right has a graph um, that shows you the number of cases over the last few days, as well as trend data in the very upper right. So as our data showed, it's a decreasing trend over the last seven days. Mm -hmm. And then the bottom half of the dashboard would have that more you know, static information that would be updated once a week based on the town of Danvers mm -hmm. data. Okay. So this would kind of change to a, a live time um, communication to share instead of doing the Friday infographics that we've been doing. And then um, the next step will also be looking at how does our reporting evolve with the change in testing model um, okay. and parents reporting. So we'll look at what that looks like for the Connect Ed messages that go out currently to see how we transition that with the new testing model. And this will be available to any parent slash citizen who wants to access it. Yes, so we wanted to share Good. it with you tonight and then it would be put onto our website sometime this week um you know we're welcome to hear any feedback right now to make tweaks to it before we officially post it well, that sounds like a positive i don't know if there's any comments to it it does sound sounds like a good deal people don't have to wait for any emails they can check themselves and they get real time yes that's great 
All right, thank you all. Um, our next item, so as we've talked about, we've done the electric division poster. Now we have deep grants, a familiar face. <laughs> Mary Beth Berry. Oh, good evening, here How in person you? tonight. Good, thank you. Um, Mary Beth Berry, current president of DEEP, the Danvers Educational Enrichment Partnership. With me this evening is Mari Matt, um, the current chair of the teacher grant program for DEEP. Again, I'd like to um, thank the acting co-superintendents, Mary Wormers, Keith Taverna, a school committee chair, Eric Crane, and school committee members for allowing us to come here this evening to talk about um, the teacher grant awards. Uh, that DEEP has awarded for the 2020-22 academic year. As a reminder, the partnership's mission is to enrich and enhance the educational opportunities within the Danvers Public Schools. We accomplish this through providing financial resources for educational and supplemental materials to support student learning and enhance curriculum and encourage innovation. <laughs> this year's grants look to provide great opportunities for students and are some examples of the thoughtful and hardworking our teachers put into their curriculum development and learning opportunities. It has not been an easy year as continued effects of COVID and the re-engagement of our students into full-time in-person learning continues to present challenges and require adjustments. We are so grateful for our educators who continue to create challenging and engaging learning opportunities for the students in Danvers, and we thank them for their thoughtful proposals this year. A few quick highlights, uh, five of the seven schools were represented this year, Smith, Great Oak, Thorpe, HRMS, and DHS. 21 proposals were submitted and 16 were funded, totaling $22,868.65. We are grateful for the district who continues to work with DEEP to identify grants that may be eligible for funding in the regular district budget. This year, five grants totaling about $5,000 were covered by the district, bringing our funded total to the 16. Top three grant categories this year were literacy, STEM, and flexible seating learning arrangements. In addition to our deep board member, Angela Chumas, we are excited to bring on five new readers from schools across the district and share a big thank you to Paula Jones from the HRMS PAC, Lauren Brown and Amanda Daniels from the Great Oak Pack, Blakely Casablari, Casabrisi from the Riverside Pack, Rob Gagnon from the Smith Pack, and Lauren Brown from the Thorpe Pack. And so here, Mari is going to read off the grant recipients, the teachers, and what their grants were. So they're up on the screen for those of you who are in the room or watching live, so I'll go quickly through them. Um, any apologies in advance? Working on all of these names. Here we go. Uh, Michaela Call and Linda Armstrong from Great Oak School for the Inclusive Classroom Library. Lisa Dorlando from Holton Rich and Middle School Project Lead the Way and their Digital Literacy Curriculum. Brittany McGrail from Danvers High School for the Drive Classroom Reboot. Alexander Conant and Megan Sorrell from Holton Richmond Middle School for the Robotics Program. Victoria Pike from Holton Richmond Middle School for different seating for a different year. Kristen Detremont, Tammy Ryan, and Mackenzie Dresner from Thorpe School for first grade STEM materials. John Hodston, Michaela Belay, and Lori Frankie from Holton Richmond Middle School for plastics in our oceans. Super interesting. Julie Glynn, John McGillan, and Matt Regis from Danvers High School for sextants and geometry. Victoria Roberts, Kristen Butler, Kristen Serino from Great Oak School for literacy math games. Michaela Domeno, Paula Morris, Renata Ulig, and Rebecca Waite. Holton Richmond Middle School for stand-up stations. Anaya, Anala Gurton, excuse me, Lisa Fitzgerald and Abby mm, Notre Giacomo <laughs> from Great Oak School, Phonic Centers for Intervention and Extension. Rachel De Dominicis and Brooke Bell from Holton Richmond Middle School, seventh grade special education seating. Sophia Schissel and Heidi Nock, Holton Richmond Middle School, Honey Beehive, Deep Dibs, on delicious honey. Looking forward to that one. Suzanne Dignard, Justina Podvani, Cynthia Grady from Smith School, developing critical readers and thinkers. Lisa Trask, Jacqueline White, Pamela Foss from Danvers High School for active learners for reading comprehension. And last but certainly not least, Anne Hoganson, Amanda Pace, Tiffany Tamilio, Lindsay Perry, Brian Vossler, Adam Weiss, and Meg Wiebenson from Danvers High School. 
From Holden Richmond, Stephanie Bennett, Emanuela Bologna, Jeannie Clausen, Elizabeth Foley, Katie Gardner, Maria Latuski, and Maria Lena Leslie for World Language Classroom Libraries, totaling $22,860.65. We thank these teachers for their thoughtfulness, for their great work, for the opportunities they're gonna provide for our students this year and next. Um, one of the beautiful things about the grants is that they often provide materials that not just last one school year, but continue to help students year in and year in and year out. So we're looking forward to the great work that will come from these efforts. Thank you very much. And we just like to thank Deep for all of their support of the teachers and extend our thank you on behalf of the teachers. Um, we did not invite them as we might have done in pre-COVID years. Um, we obviously formed the agenda before we moved here and just made the decision that it would just have Mary Beth and Mari come and recognize them. So thank you on their behalf from us. Yes, and thank you. you. And thank so you. I just thank wanted to add a couple me. things. All teachers have been notified and some have even already been ordering their materials. Um, I also wanna thank folks that are here that are listening to us. I appreciate you. I know you're here probably for another presentation, but I do appreciate you staying, unlike some folks that left because their topic was over. But this is important information for you to hear, for the community to hear, because this is the work that's being done in the community, for the community, for the students. So I just wanted to give a shout out to that. Um, this will also serve as a deep update right now. Um, just wanna let you know that on February 9th, the Holton Richmond Deep Spelling Bee will be taking place and it will be happening at the Danvers High School in person. I wanna thank Ellen Ferrick, Mary Wormers, Brendan Norton, uh, and all the teachers for the support and helping to identify the students that will be participating. There'll be roughly 40 students in grades six through eight that will be participating in this spelling bee with the opportunity for the winner to move on to the regional spelling bee that will be taking place later on, I believe in February or early March. Um, the next deep meeting is on February 16th at 8 a.m. at the Brookline Bank here in Danvers. And just wanted to announce also that our proposed wine tasting that was maybe going to happen March 31st will be pushed out to October. Um, with things currently in flux right now, um, we thought it best to move it forward and hopefully by October of 2022, we will be back to a little bit more of a normal um, situation where we can enjoy food and wine and businesses will be able to participate um, by then. Um, and as always, DEEP's always looking for new members to help um, continue the great work that DEEP has been doing since the 90s, which is raising the funds to help support um, student learning in the Danvers Public Schools. So with that, if there's any questions that we can answer. Any questions or comments from the committee? Thank you. Yeah, for, yeah, I mean, I think just more of a sincere thanks for everything that you do for our students and our teachers, because I, I do know from teachers that um, a lot of them do put in applications for the grants and that grant money is very much appreciated and you know our students taking advantage of it is so um, you know appreciated too thank you yeah given how difficult it's been to uh, I'm sure to fundraise to some extent over the last couple of years mm -hmm. it's uh, really appreciated that you can still run this program and have it be so robust and everybody appreciates it thank you Mary yeah. Beth Thank you. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. Oh, uh, most important, sorry. I um, want to thank our, the community members that support DEEP, the sponsors that support us year after year and support the students in learning. We could not do it without them. We could not do it without their, their support. And like you said, Eric, it has been very challenging the last couple of years. We have been unable to do any real fundraising because of what's going on, uh, but we've been able to still support um, what we feel is most important um, in the community here in Danvers, Danvers Public Schools. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Danvers, we have a Danvers Pride presentation on the return of Danvers Pride. It's the return of Danvers Pride, and we decided that uh, this uh, presentation uh, by Amy Cassette and uh, Nora Nickerson was uh, very appropriate because uh, we had the whole Richmond uh, calendar got back to school after the new year and uh, we determined it was going to be a 
virtual presentation, so they, uh, Nora, as well as Andreas, and Camilla, and Ty all had to videotape all the presentations, send them to Amy and myself, and we had to try to put it into the format, but we're going to do a live presentation tonight, so we're going to call them up and talk about the civic program that they do in grade 8. As mentioned earlier, our presentation was a part of last Monday's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. event. Um, civics is, important, is an important course because it teaches our students about how our national system of government works and how to engage actively in our local communities. Through activities like Identity Trees, civics also connects directly to the Danvers Public School goal to live in inclusive communities of in an inclusive community of learners that is respectful of individual difference and in which all students are valued for their unique strengths, talents, and challenges. So without further ado, here's Ms. Fassett. Ms. Fassett will start us off. Thank you, Mr. Norton. So thank you for having us. We are honored and really excited to be here to share just a little bit about what we do. We're now in the third year of the new civics curriculum, and we couldn't be happier. It's something that my colleagues, Liza Barrett, Marcy Gelinas, and I take great pride in. Uh, it's such an important subject where students are really able to make those everyday connections. And it's amazing to see the adult, mature, intelligent conversations that these kids can have held with poise. So Mr. Norton and I think, think alike, great minds. <laughs> and I'd like to introduce Nora. Um, hello, my name is Nora Nickerson. I do the musical and I'm in Hoxton Harmony and I'm currently taking civics and I'm an eighth grader. So what is civics? Civics can also be known as citizen education or democracy education. It's a vehicle that prepares students and young people today to become well-informed citizens and future voters while allowing them to be active, civically engaged community participants now. It's also a tool to teach kids about democracy and the importance of upholding all of these values. This year, one of the highlights that we have to look forward to is working with Jen Breaker. We're actually meeting with her tomorrow, um, as well as the town hall when we're, um, when we're learning about our local town government and collaborating with the town officials during our student action project, which we'll mention a little bit later. And another important point to stress is that I teach my students how to think, not what to think. Today's generation of children plays a vital role in creating an inclusive and welcoming community both within Danvers and the world beyond. The future of democracy depends on our students' development of knowledge, skills, and dispositions that will enable them to embrace democracy's potential while recognizing its challenges and inherent dilemmas. Civics is important to me because it's a safe community where we can all explore different cultures and learn how to respect other people despite their backgrounds. We also learn how to talk about difficult topics without being insensitive to others' pasts. Community to me is a safe space where we can all be who we are and a respectful and kind space where you feel welcomed and you want to be a part of.
our first unit was the identity tree project, involved the identity tree project. We looked at who we are as individuals and what makes us us. Our task was to create an, ad an identity tree with words or graphics that illustrate who we are on the inside and on the outside. Our biggest questions were who are you, how does your identity, and how does your identity influence your view on the world? The product of that project was a tree where we could see where our roots were, which was like our past. We would put important people, places, events, and anything that has had a lasting effect on who we are. The trunk is who we are now. It, we would put personality traits and anything we were comfortable sharing. Outside of the trunk on the left is how other people see us, where we could see, like ask peers on how we, how we present ourselves to the classroom. On the right is how we try and make ourselves be, whether this is through social media or just how you intend to come across. And the branches and anything in the sky was the hopes and dreams for the future and changes we would want to see in the world. After we finished all of our trees, while keeping them anonymous, we posted them around the classroom and we could do a gallery walk where we could see everyone's identities and what they put. This allowed us to see how other individuals in our classroom community, um, like what their in experiences were um, with cultures and backgrounds so we could make sure to be sensitive to their experiences and potential biases that they could have. This um, is very important when it comes to when we have um, more controversial discussions. Um, here are some of the products from the, um, from the project and unit. The importance of this unit was to be able to share our experiences while learning more about others and finding more about ourselves. We also became more aware of how our experiences affect our biases and how to be respectful with said biases. So uh, just a short little quote that resonates with me and just something to think about is, the farther backward you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. Part of our civics curriculum is connecting the past and the present. Within our topics, we study our country's um, a timeline of um, and including groups who have been oppressed. We look at the civil rights movement Again, a timeline of our country's uh, voting history, including um, black Americans, women's, women's suffrage movement, Native Americans. We also learn about monumental Supreme Court cases regarding interracial and same-sex marriages. And this goes back to the idea of teaching my students how to think, not what to think. And students are always presented with multiple perspectives and mostly in the form of primary sources.
One of my favorite parts of our curriculum are the debates and discussion, and especially with practicing civil discourse. So in practicing and engaging in civil discourse is necessary in order to have a productive conversation, especially when it comes to talking about long-standing and sometimes controversial issues. Some of the topics and coming up next week are our Second Amendment rights and cruel and unusual punishment, aka the death penalty. So for all you history buffs, the Second and Eighth Amendments. And a former student, now a sophomore, wrote, what I learned and will use in the future is how I argue, is how to argue in a formal and polite way while debating my argument in an effective way. While we haven't started the debate unit yet, we have had practice with civil discourse. During Project Talk, um, we came up with um, norms for when we do have debates or discussions. Um, we all came to the conclusion that we will value all opinions and respect others. We will listen carefully and intently and stay engaged. We will show patience and grace and keep a calm voice. We will practice positive, positive body language and give nonverbal affirmations. And we will acknowledge that discomfort is okay. Like I said, we haven't started the debates, but we know that when we do start the debates and get into more controversial topics, that we will have to keep these norms to make sure that it is a respectful space still. Last year was our first year of implementing our student-led action project. It's, a, it's an amazing um, project where kids really take ownership of that. Um, the Student-Led Action Project is a cumulative project that provides young adults, like ourselves, the opportunity to practice civil, civic knowledge of our government, as well as civic skills, in order to identify a problem and to engage in the process to make a change in our community. I hope she's going to say just what you said. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So I kind of mentioned this um, a little bit before, but the assignment was to, to find something in the community that the kids would like to improve. So through a variety of activities, we're able to create a list. And, and last year we kept it because of COVID um, and it being our first year, we kept it on a small scale and we, we stuck within our, our school community. And um, Camilla had said, we all found something that we were interested in and wanted to fix or improve. And we have some examples. There was um, recycling within neighborhoods, having better meals in the cafeteria, unfair treatment toward a particular sex, and many more.
Most importantly, I want my students to learn that along with the opportunities and freedoms that they have as Americans, they also have a responsibility to leave this world a better place. Thank you. Thank you, Amy and Nora, for such a great presentation on our civics, some of the work that you do in civics and uh, the Civics Action Project. That is um, actually a state uh, mandated uh, mm -hmm. project that all eighth graders do in the, across the Commonwealth. Great. Questions and comments from my colleagues? No, thank you for presenting it. I think um, I've been saying this for quite a while. We have so many wonderful programs within our town. Um, in our school, so it's just so nice to see it come to life. So thank you for taking the time to take us through it. And please extend our thanks to <laughs> the two remote students as well yeah. for bringing this commission here. Yeah, the, all, the, all of the students who presented, uh, that's a lot, lot to present, and that was really, really good. And you should be very proud. And uh, I hope that all of uh, your peers have the same engagement and excitement about the topic as you do. So we thank, uh, thank you to the teachers and to the students who are participating and bringing this to life. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. It's, 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 no, um, it's good to have uh, the Danvers Pride presentations back, isn't it? It is, it is. <laughs> we haven't heard from the kids for a long time, so it was good to hear, hear this tonight, and thanks. And maybe we all need the course on civil discourse. You know? <laughs> uh, so okay. thank you, and now go home and do your homework. <laughs> Thanks for sitting through all this, Dad. Thank you. <laughs> you should be proud. You did great. I think she might have a future as a public speaker. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, that was a great segue for our safe and supportive um, learning environments presentation. Uh, if you remember, a couple of years, uh, a couple of years, it seems like years, a couple of months ago, uh, we started uh, doing presentations on each of our three pillars: um, the coherent curriculum, uh, instruction, and assessment, and then. In December, we did diversity, <laughs> equity, and inclusion, and then this uh, month, we're doing safe and supportive learning environments. So I start with this uh, graphic. Uh, my colleagues will laugh at me. I'm always trying to like do a visual for like where we are and what we're thinking about. And a lot of our work has really been focused on, you know, our in our community, our Danvers Public Schools community. That you know, our goal is that everyone belongs. That every like an engaged student is seen, heard, and valued in our community. And I think that ultimately and at the end of the day, that is where we stand, and a lot of the work we do, that is what we're striving for. Um, so uh, in our strategic plan, we had the following goals for uh, this pillar. We had that we wanted to support all students in an inclusive, emotionally supportive, and culturally responsive environment. We want to focus on community. I think we've got that for the last presentation. We want to prioritize student safety and implement practices that build social emotional capacities within students, faculty, and staff. These are our priorities that we started out with in August, and we, they still uh, stay with us, that we really work on uh, creating a welcoming community for all. We provide ongoing professional development on diversity, equity, and inclusion for all adults. We we are, our goal is to recruit and retain a diverse and culturally responsive workforce. We want to con conduct um, equity audits of policies, procedures, and programs. We're going to work on including history of racial oppression and works by authors of color and works from diverse perspectives in our curriculum. And we will be communicating about issues of racism and hate. So, um, so again, our vision is really, our Danvers Public School vision really kind of supports the work that we do. Um, as It's been read a few times tonight, so I don't read it again to you, but these are two statements from that vision that we really feel supports our social emotional learning that happens. And you, I think you've all recognized this wheel by now. We've done a, you know, some presentations around uh, the five uh, social emotional learning co uh, competencies, and these are the five that are up there. Self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. So in Danvers, we do do explicit teaching of social emotional uh, competencies and we do it in different ways at different levels. So at the elementary level, we do have a uh, block of time that's every uh, day for 15 minutes. What we do for this curriculum is we uh, use our open circle uh, social emotional learning curriculum and we pair that with uh, 
social emotional learning read aloud. So the books really tell the story about the uh, uh, characters, you know, really uh, using the, one of the five competencies. And what it looks like for teachers is uh, like a little Google Slides uh, presentation, and it gives them all the information they need to be able to teach um, the lessons to students. So it gives them, you know, our goals, the standards that we meet, the the. Danvers SEL um, standards that it's meeting. It gives uh, the read aloud book. It gives a link to that book. It gives a uh, link to all the lessons in Open Circle. Gives you additional resources. You can see on here it's a self management lesson. So we use the terminology and zone, zones of regulation uh, to the color coding that they have. The red is like an angry, you know, I'm an elevated student. Um, yellow is I'm, I'm headed towards uh, to the red. The, the blue is um, you're in a calm space, the green is like I'm in really good space for learning. So a lot of teachers have been using that uh, over the years to help kids communicate their feelings. And then uh, you can see in this lesson that there's another, there's another uh, read aloud and more lessons for kids to do. So that's what it looks like at the elementary level. At Holton Richmond Middle School, we have explicit SEL and uh, anti-bullying lessons that are taught uh, during Project Talk, which is about 30 minutes each month. Um, but the uh, one different uh, twist that uh, Holton Richmond takes is really working on integrating the SEL skills into academic lessons. And they're able to uh, do that work this year because we do have a, a social emotional learning coach um, in Jeff Bartlett. And he uh, has one of our teaching fellows that goes in and works with him, so covers his health class while he's able to go in and integrate with academic teachers or work with a, a team to think about how to uh, integrate uh, SEL instruction in their academic class. And then um, at Danvers High School, as you've heard of many times, it's a community block. It's 25 minutes daily. You'll see the yellow, if you see the yellow blocks there, that's when community meetings happening and that's when there is SEL um, and relationship building lessons that are happening once every seven days. Um, that is done by student leaders. There's a course at Danvers High, you'll hear more about that coming up with Peter. And um, they, they facilitate these activities, and so it's really powerful when the, the students are facilitating other students. Um, the other thing that uh, Danvers High started to do is that they are working on um, bias work, anti-bias work, so doing some implicit bias lessons recently. Um, that's happening during the red assembly block, so um, Adam and Peter have been working to do those lessons to the whole grade level at one time. But then they go back into that learning block, into the community block, and actually do lessons with that. So um, the implicit bias uh, work had, um, just like uh, the identity trees you saw at Holt Richmond, well, they did identity maps, and these are the maps of a few of our high school students. So they did that with, um, uh, they did a rough draft with uh, Peter and Adam, and then when they got into the community block, they actually make digital versions of their identity. And then some homerooms really took it a step further and, and started to talk about like our identity, but when we're paired together and each one of those hands represents a student in the community block, if we build relationships and community within our, our group so that they can, as Nora was talking about earlier in her presentation, have those difficult conversations that they might have um, about things that are happening you know, within the school or this, uh, you know, and you know, imp doing some of the implicit bias and anti-racist work that they might do in those blocks. So that's, that's social emotional learning, and that's my part of the presentation. I'm gonna have Whitney uh, McNeely come up. She's kind of our little spokesperson for um, Danvers Cares, and she's gonna give us a recap of some of the activities. Yeah, thank you. So my name is Whitney McNeely. I'm a high school guidance counselor at Danvers and the programming coordinator for Danvers Cares. So Danvers Cares, as you may know, is a dynamic community partnership that supports youth and families in making healthy decisions. Our Danvers High School and Middle School after school clubs foster positive youth development for our community and a safe and supportive environment within our schools. So this year, the Danvers High School Club has asked students to promote the concept of attendance matters. So this has been an issue across the country, especially since the pandemic. Club advisors Stephanie DeSimone and Karen Robinson directed students to make their own posters for the campaign, and you'll see them hanging up around the school. Each poster has a unique reason listed by a student why every day matters. The middle school Danvers Cares Club is led by Rebecca Waite, and those students attended the Danvers tree lighting back in December. Students represented the club, sold ornaments, and um, carried the banner in the parade. So now I'm going to discuss three of our community partners and their positive effects on our school environment 
and how it made it more safe and supportive. So the first partner is NAGLI, the North Shore Alliance for LGBTQ plus youth. NAGLI visited the high school and the middle school recently to create a welcoming presence for LGBTQ plus youth and allies. Students were invited to sign the pride flag and take home NAGLI bracelets and other merch. So the next community partner is the NAN Project. This is a nonprofit that brings mental health speakers to schools. The NAN Project speakers presented in high school health classes last week, and our hope is for students who hear these lessons and speeches to feel more connected, less alone, and to understand better how to help themselves or a friend when they're in crisis. And the third uh, community partner I'm talking about is the Beverly Hospital. And this is a bit of a longer example, just to give you an idea of the safe and supportive environment. So the Beverly Hospital led a focus group that myself, Stephanie, and Karen co-facilitated for 14 students that we kept anonymous. The leader asked our youth to share positive and negative experiences with health and wellness related resources in our schools and our community. This discussion was excellent, actually, and it had full engagement from every student that was there. The conversation was intended to be 45 minutes, but it ended up being over an hour and a half due to the enthusiasm of our students. So some notable things that they shared included that they agreed they can adequately access healthy food options for lunch. They, uh, they agreed that they can find plenty of opportunities for physical exercise through the athletics department, the rec department of the town, or the YMCA in town. They all agreed that they can access mental health resources and other resources in school thanks to the nurses, guidance counselors, and social workers. And then some negative experiences that they listed were trying to change our school culture. Passionately, they discussed all these ways they had ideas on how to improve it, have more uh, positive social discussions like we talked about for the middle school is doing. Um, and it's a difficult topic, but they all agreed they really are passionate about approaching it more in the future. So they expressed that it is difficult for them to decide when to remain quiet and when to speak up when faced with a peer who is being disrespectful. And this concept, we'll talk more about being a bystander versus an upstander. And they all agreed that the pandemic has impacted their mental health. It's a national problem. It's reflected here in Danvers, just like it is in every school in the country right now. Um, learning and living on social, on social media and online for school was really difficult, and they're anxious for how things are panning out. Um, so this was a really honest discussion with the students, so it was really amazing to be there for it. I just wanted to share some quotes from students that were there. A junior said, I didn't know I related to my peers so much. I didn't know how many of the other students felt, but I really connected to them after this. A senior in the room said, this was the best discussion I've been a part of in years in high school. And another senior said, very impressively said, we are working towards an understanding of others. We are affected by what happens every day at the school. And this group was very helpful to learn what we have in common. It's time for us to start the work. So I wanted to add that quote. I thought it was very well said. Um, so this group discussion we had that one day in the fall gave the three staff members, Stephanie, Karin, and I, just the inspiration to try to replicate this experience again for our students in the future and give them that safe and supportive environment and hopefully more connections. Um, so lastly, our team is hoping to do a healing event for the community that will happen in the spring. And that is all my updates for the community. Thank you. Thank you, Whitney. Thank you. Okay, next up is uh, Andy St. Pierre with the uh, Wellness. Good evening, everyone. I'll just give a quick update on our wellness committee meetings. We meet four times a year uh, with representatives across the district. In November, uh, we met as we usually do to review the wellness policy. We received a food services update from uh, Emily Cook and the director of food services. Uh, we talked very briefly initially about the Light the Night Purple event, uh, which hopefully will be coming back in the spring, about soliciting volunteers to help us get that uh, event back in action after a little layoff. Then we spoke about um, the Atlas and Athena program, which is sort of the mentor program we have uh, for freshman student athletes, uh, helping uh, those freshmen sort of transition into high school and discuss issues, uh, topics that might come up in their careers at, at the high school level. Where we pair up upper class uh, student leaders, student athlete leaders with freshmen and sort of talk through different drugs and alcohol, health and wellness, nutrition, physical fitness, that sort of stuff. 
And this year we actually had a, a component about uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, anti-bias. Uh, that went, went over really well. I've been doing this for a bunch of years now, and this was the, the best attended one we've had across the board. A couple years ago, we moved from once a week for four or five weeks, and we moved it to just one week every day after school, um, and the last day was the, the anti-bias stuff. It was just really was a positive experience. The turnout was good. The participation was really great. So we're looking forward to growing that in the future. In January, we got a, a Danvers Cares update similar to what you just received um, from Whitney about the positive youth development. We got an, an update on the baseline testing impact program uh, from our trainer, Ms. Amanda Porter. Uh, it's basically just, it's, it helps us diagnose and, and treat kids uh, with supposed head injuries and return them to play in, in a proper manner safely uh, so they can get, get back in action and get back in school and do the, the right stuff. We re also reviewed the concussion policy as a district uh, and what it means and who it affects uh, throughout the district. In February, we will discuss the Youth Risk Behavior Survey that we'll be administering in the, in the spring for both the middle school and high school students. We will discuss the chemical health policy, which is the drug and alcohol and substance policy that affects student athletes. We'll have an equity training update. And then in March, our final meeting, we will have an expert screening update from the nurses. We'll discuss EpiPen, CPR training, AED, and Narcan updates. And then finally, we will uh, talk about Light the Night Purple, which will be a busy time for that group um, in, in the preparation for that event, which uh, we're all looking forward to as a, as a group. Are there any questions for the Wellness Committee? Any questions on the presentation so far? Thank you, Andy. You're welcome. Okay, and then our last speaker for the Safe and Supportive Schools is Adam Federico, and um, he worked with some Danvers High students to create a Danvers High anonymous reporting form. So just very quickly, uh, a lot of the work that we've been doing is around student voice and empowering students to improve the culture at our school. Uh, one thing that the student body uh, felt strongly about was improving the ability to report things that are happening um, that are concerning. And so we worked with our uh, Issues to Action Club and Anti-Discrimination Club to come up with a anonymous reporting form. Um, the students actually felt strongly that it needed to be a paper-based form. They, they felt that technology-based uh, wouldn't have the same impact and kids wouldn't take it as seriously, but they felt like that a paper-based form, um, that students would, that if they're taking that form, they're gonna take the time because it's meaningful and it's important. So we developed um, you know, this with our student groups using a lot of their suggestions around language. And um, this is now in play. It's been shared with the student body and the faculty. They're available in every classroom, every instructional space. And these forms can be filled out, given to any adult in the building. They'll be transferred to the, uh, the main office, to the administration, where it will result in an investigation of whatever the concern is that's raised. And we've already had um, some turned in. So we feel like it's, a, it's just another avenue for kids who are maybe hesitant to bring something forward. This gives them a different way to share concerning information that they witnessed or that they experienced. I mean, I would simply say, I know we've talked about this, and uh, it's nice to see that you've rolled it out pretty quickly, put it together. Um, sounds like you got student input, too, into what it would be and what it would look like. And uh, so when you get these forms, it will trigger a response from the administration? And, and, uh, Correct. It'll, it'll, it'll trigger an investigation into whatever was reported. It, the anonymous form alone can't result in disciplinary action or, or formal action, but the the form triggers the investigation, which can then lead to whatever whatever steps make sense or whatever referrals make sense. I like that. To, to me, it, it enters a level of, uh, creates a level of accountability, and it eliminates the I told somebody versus no, we never heard about it. So I think that's great. So other comments from Mr. Ray? No. Okay. We're good. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Adam. talked about on the kind of the visioning that we've done around the uh, diversity, equity, inclusion work in the district. And then uh, this is a list of uh, what's been happening it's starting in January with our diversity, equity, inclusion work. Uh, we have the Holocaust Symposium, which um, um, members of the community, uh, Danvers High students, um, Danvers High um, teachers and administrators take part in um, on Thursdays from, uh, from January 6th through uh, February 10th. 
We have the uh, elementary community uh, learning workshop, which happened last Tuesday and will join, happen um, uh, this coming Tuesday uh, to really talk about what um, some of the uh, culturally responsive work we're doing at the elementary level. We, um, Janelle Ridley started, I think, today with the um, student leadership game design um, for student athletes. Um, they're working with her. Um, the MIAA has two um, opportunities that our students are taking part in. It's the Antique Bias Pledge and NFSH um, online course. And then we have the MIAA Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Summit um, that happened last week, last Friday. We had students attend that. Uh, we are continuing our culturally responsive read aloud texts and civics units at all, you know, elementary through high school. Um, that's ongoing throughout the school year. And then um, we, as administrators, um, and Robin is a member of our team as a school committee rep, um, have participated in the culturally responsive practices leadership academy. It's helping us with the visioning and um, for our diversity, equity, inclusion work, and really helping us think, uh, use a, a new equity tool to kind of help us think through any kind of planning uh, or processes that we do. And then finally, a uh, group of administrators and counselors are gonna be working on a, um, a series of workshops called Doing Discipline Differently, kind of looking at that uh, trauma and uh, trauma-informed kind of discipline and um, restorative practices. And that starts uh, this Thursday, and we will have follow-up conversations um, on February 1st and March 1st. So that is our presentation. All right, do we have any comments or questions uh, overall? No, I, I think that the district is doing great work and it's, I think a lot of people want change quickly. Like we are really doing the deep work, it takes time. Um, but just like all the things that we just talked about, it's gonna happen, it, it's just gonna take time. And I think, you know, the administrators, the teachers, all the staff members, the superintendents, like they're, they want the change, they're putting in the work, we believe in it. It's, it's awesome, it's just gonna take time, but it's ongoing. So I think that's just important for the community to remember. Anyone else? I would say, I just wanna mention the elementary community learning workshops. Uh, those of us who were able I think attended last week and will attend tomorrow night. And uh, it was really enlightening and it was, uh, looked like a great example of what, uh, what we're doing at the elementary school level. And, and we got to see some of the materials that are uh, being used and kind of walking through some of the activities. So uh, it, was, it was really good. And I think those from the community who took the opportunity, um, I think really learned something and got to observe what we're doing. So, and overall, Boy, there's a lot of stuff going on at every level on the whole issue of equity and inclusion and a safe space and uh, really, really like what we see. So thank you. Thank you. All right, so, all right, it appears to me that we are on to new business. We, so. Yes, <laughs> we have the Holden Richmond Program of Studies for First Reading, so I'd like a motion. Yes, so the, um, the acting uh, superintendents recommend sure. <laughs> yep. for, uh, the approval of the Holden Richmond uh, Middle School Program of Studies for First Reading. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Uh, I think it'd be good just to highlight the changes real quick, yep. and, and uh, that's it. Ellen Farrick will be coming up to give you an overview. I think on your agenda um, memo, you'll see uh, mm -hmm. the, no, I guess not, it's just the program of studies. Sorry, just getting the uh, right tab to load here. Okay, so, um, as you'll see in the agenda or in the memo, we um, didn't make too many changes this year. We've updated our learning goals to reflect our school-wide emphasis on academic and social emotional learning outcomes. In the past, um, there was a segment on 21st century learning skills that really coincided with our move to um, one-to-one -one Chromebooks and really infusing those technology skills into the classroom and now those have become so commonplace that we felt like that didn't necessarily need to be emphasized in the program of studies. Um, the English language arts course descriptions now reflect um, 
the inclusion of the Teachers College Reading and Writing Project reading units of studies. We had implemented the writing units several years ago, and now we're starting to infuse the reading units of study as well. And so uh, the descriptions include that language. Um, probably the bulk of the changes discuss the revised mathematics course descriptions as we've implemented the Carnegie Learning Math program in grades six through eight. So our descriptions reflect that. And uh, we have an updated description of the Exploring Mathematics course, just really for kind of clarity of purpose and um, to be just a little bit, give a little clearer sense to students and families in the community what that course looks like. And then finally, um, as we heard about tonight, the action project in the grade, grade eight civics course, because it was a pilot program last year, we weren't really sure what it was going to look like. We were able to put in uh, more information about what the action project entails. Any okay. questions about program well, studies? Yeah, so that's for, so this is for first reading, meaning if we have suggestions or changes, it's best to offer them now. It'll come back next month for a final vote. So I'm gonna open it up, Alice, do you have any no, no, I'm part of the subcommittee, um, so I was taken through it in uh, a lot of detail, um, and I, you know, I want to make sure Ellen gets the credit that she deserves because this isn't giving her enough credit. I think um, what I learned, just even as a parent, is how our curriculum has been updated and continues to be updated, and what that means for our teachers and our students. Um, over the course of the last couple of years. So uh, it was just very re refreshing for me to hear it and to see it. Um, there's just a lot of passion from the whole team at the middle school level um, around the curriculum and, and the changes that have been made. So I just want to make sure that you know the rest of the committee knows that Robin wasn't able to join. She was sick, but um, she reviewed it herself um, as well. So uh, no questions or comments. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't able to attend it. I, I looked at it as an educator perspective, um, and I was. It was nice. To, I think Alice looked at it from you know a parent perspective. So um, I mean, I I thought it was very clear. I mean, I honestly didn't even realize all the amazing classes that we had at the middle school. Yeah. I don't think they existed when I attended. Maybe they did, and they just weren't publicized. I don't know. Um, but I think it really. You know, I encourage the, I encourage families to actually look at it because I think that you really will see all the opportunities that your student has by attending the middle school, and again when we get to high school piece too. So, thank you. Yeah, questions or comments? No, I mean I, I I agree. I think you know every year or two we you know really take a very hard look at the the courses and the curriculum and tie it into everything we talked about tonight the civics etc so um, it, it's good to see the overall story unfold and then see actual courses come in which which solidify that thinking so it's it's much appreciated thank you it's just going no oh, nothing uh, nothing uh, much but it's good to I mean I think what uh, Robin and Alice say is something that we've been watching over the past um, several years, and 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 it's good to get the perspective of, of the two of them who have now mm -hmm. you know now have seen it uh, because it, it it kind of validates what I already think. <laughs> um, um, but uh, no, I think I think the, the what's available is is great, and um, we continue to do a good job with that. And um, so I don't see I, I'm, I'm happy with. It. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm content as well, so thank you for the presentation. Of course, um, thank you. We will uh, have a motion. I have a second. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor for first reading say aye. 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 Opposed, none. There you go. All right, and next up, the high school uh, proposed studies. So um, the acting uh, superintendents recommend uh, the approval of the Danvers High Program of Studies for first reading. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, motion and a second. Any changes that you want to make us aware of? That's a good place to focus. Yeah. Yes, so I'll just go through a quick overview. Um, to summarize the major changes, uh, we're continuing to think about ways we can, we can provide a variety of opportunities for students to pursue um, individualized or advanced uh, study at the high school. 
Um, so we have new options for seniors um, as their area of a concentration gets more focused um, as they um, go into their fourth year of study. Um, we have other courses in our unified arts department um, that allow students to um, refine skills after they've taken at the foundational level. And also some new opportunities uh, for students to um, practice student leadership in the building. Um, so sir, first, just to quickly go over some senior opportunities. Um, in our uh, math department, we have a new quantitative reasoning uh, class as a fourth year math course, uh, also typically offered at the college level to expand on options available to students not interested in taking AP level math courses. Um, in ELA, we've added a social justice literature as a senior year course. Um, and we don't have a traditional ELA 11, 12 course at DHS. They take a more individualized uh, course to meet um, the needs or interests that they have. Um, so this will join the other senior ELA courses such as AP Literature, uh, College Career and Communication, Evolution of the Hero, and Writing Workshop. Um, and then also for our 12th graders, we've restructured uh, a world language elective um, for Spanish for Intermediate Contemporary Topics. Um, and this allows students to build their intermediate for Spanish skills in a topic domain of interest to them uh, while increasing their voice and choice and picking the topics they'd like to discuss while building their language proficiency. And so these full year electives include life after high school, Latin American music, words and actions, and Latin American history and society. Um, additionally, uh, in addition to our expansion of opportunities for seniors, we're also offering new advanced coursework in other departments. Uh, so in science, we're adding medical interventions, honors, um, which sounds very exciting. I'd love to teach that course. Um, <laughs> it'll be the third course in our Project Lead the Way Biomedical Science Pathway. Um, so it, in, in addition to our first two courses in the se sequence, Principles of Biomedical Science and Human Body Systems. Huh. And then in our Unified Arts Department, we have several new offerings, offerings including Advanced Manufacturing, uh, DECA 3, Advanced Entrepreneurial Studies, Advanced Digital Photography, and AP Art Drawing. And so we're excited to continue to offer these opportunities to students that have enjoyed and mastered the foundational skills in these areas and want to continue to refine and push further in their learning. Additionally, in our Special Education Fundamentals program, we've ensured that students have a full complement of options in the co-taught or fundamental setting, including the addition of courses such as discrete math, U.S. government and civic engagement, and marine ecology. Um, and then lastly, the last two things I want to talk about um, as we're thinking about opportunities for student leadership, both within our school community um, and in their college and career preparation. We've added the course Leadership and Community Honors to the Program of Studies, which directly supports the creation of the community block structure, which Mary talked about earlier. So a significant course objective is for the participating students to help lead the school's community meeting program by working with the instructors in the classes and the classmates uh, to prepare the engaging content for the sessions. So all the lessons for the community meetings are driven directly by the students in that class. Um, and so they're in charge of initiating, um, uh, assisting in the constructive conversations, using protocols, doing the SCL activities um, and other additional projects um, in, in terms of facilitating reflections, uh, public speaking practice, and personal identity studies. Um, and additionally, we're excited to pilot our early college program this spring in partnership with North Shore Community College. So we've added descriptions of the first uh, three courses students will take as part of the early college program. Um, and we'll add the remaining courses over the next two years once they're finalized, um, potentially allowing students in the program to graduate with 25 college credits that can transfer to North Shore uh, or public colleges, universities. So the ones included um, are the first course students will take in the um, spring semester of their sophomore year, Understanding Higher Education. Um, and then we've also included the two classes they take during their junior year, Speech and Composition. Um, so overall, we're just excited to provide all these additional opportunities um, and look forward to our continued work with students um, to provide them with uh, meaningful coursework as they finish their high school career. Great. So let's turn to our uh, again, the members of the student committee. So let's start with Robin this time and then Alice. This got brought up earlier, Alice and I. I think this dual enrollment, because we're talking a lot about like numbers, this, and I don't know, maybe Essex Tech does it, I don't know, I know that, you know, the private schools know. This, I think, could be like a really big sell because I'm thinking like, you're gonna, you said 25 credits, you could, okay. So you can then finish, right, like at yeah. North Shore Community College, and then from there, there are certain schools, I don't remember what they were, then we'll take you, like, it's like a 
the tuition cheaper, right? Like you'll save so time, yeah, save money. Like all that. What? Yeah. So I mean, I think this could be like a really big sell, and I don't want to use it like the mar like marketing, but like it's almost like this. I think is a great marketing tool for DHS. Mm -hmm. Like we have awesome resources for the kids. Mm -hmm. We talked about this. Um, we do not give ourselves enough credit um, of the courses that we offer our students. And I think we can do a much better job in getting our students excited about the high school and what we do have to offer. Um, you know, I know we talked earlier about Essex Tech specifically, but we're competing against five other schools just within our town. And what our school offers, I don't, I think we need to not wait until the eighth grade to educate families and students about it. I think we need to get them excited about it at, in the sixth grade because as a parent, I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my God, yeah, he could take this and that and graduate, have 25 college credits, are you kidding me? Um, so I, I think we need to, even just as a school committee and as an administration, like. What can we do to get our kids excited about the high school um, in a more meaningful way? And I think the courses that we offer can go a long, long way. That's a great point. Thank you. Uh, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it is a, a big selling point. I mean, I think the older you get in high school, you are in many cases becoming more focused. So looking at the course offerings, you know, just picking one or two of those, but particularly I'll just say this, if, if you maybe haven't found a club or an activity that you've particularly done, or maybe you're, you're in, in sports or athletics and you've devoted four years or so to a particular sport, maybe you haven't, you know, picked something in, um, in terms of an activity, you could go into, you know, marine biology or and that's a good way for you to test and say, you know, do I really want to do this in college? And maybe you don't have to take one of the, the, the college courses that give you extra college credit, but you can, you can pick it in advance. So that's where I've sort of seen this evolve over the past few years. And I think, I, I think it's the right strategy, right? I, I think it's a, it's a great way for kids who have an interest who can really push themselves to see where they want to go. So I'm glad that this is where we're headed. Awesome. The only thing that I would add to what Robin said is that um, I think marketing is an okay word to use because, <laughs> because um, that's what we should be doing. We should be um, showing everybody what we have and what we can do. Um, the prep markets, the tech markets, um, Pingry markets, they all market and that's mm -hmm. how they get their students. And so we need to not be, uh, we need to, to think like that too and we mm -hmm. need to be showing our middle school kids um, and, the, and, the, and their parents in the, in the community that we have all of these things that we can offer. And um, so marketing is, is an absolute appropriate word to use because mm -hmm. we have things that we can market. Yep. And my overall feeling about the high school is similar to the middle school. I think we've done a, you know, done a really good job over the past several years. Um, obviously we have a, a whole group of new courses here. I don't want to teach medical interventions, but I want to take medical <laughs> so, uh, so, but great job, and, 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 I, and really, I, I'm serious, don't be, don't be shy about marketing what we have, because we need to get the word out. Yeah, and I would agree, and the, the idea of doing it a little earlier, too, not waiting until eighth grade, yeah. I like that, um, because we do, we have a good story to tell, and the more we tell it, I think the better it will be, so yeah. thank you, thank you for how you've done this, thank this you. is terrific. We have a motion, we have a second. Uh, with uh, any further discussion, hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye for first reading. Aye. 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 All those opposed, none carries. So uh, we'll come back next month for a final adoption. Thank you all. All right, so I think we are ready to move. We have no unfinished business. We'll move on to our order of business. Um, we have the consent agenda. I would accept a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. A motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Is there a second? Second. Right. Are there any questions on any individual item on the agenda? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, none carries. 
minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would move to approve and release the minutes from the December 13th, 2021 regular meeting, the December 30th, 2021 regular meeting, and to approve and not release the minutes of the December 30th, 2021 executive session. Uh, that was a motion, right? That was so a motion. just looking for a second. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, none, carries. Uh, communications, I think we only have the NEC, Keith, is that correct? Yes, and there's no real items to highlight because they're ongoing agenda okay. items. And as I said, next month we'll, uh, we'll fill the role temporarily so that we have a representative who can vote. Um, legislation, we heard from Sally, I have nothing to add. Uh, subcommittee liaisons, curriculum and assessment, would it be fair to say that we've heard? Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Equity, anything to, to offer on that, Jeff, or are you good? No, I think, I think we covered a lot of it here, honestly, with, with Mary Review. Okay. Uh, Paul, did the policy subcommittee? Nope, we did not. not. Uh, deep, we heard from Mary Beth, gave us a great update. Danvers Cares. I, I think Andy talked a lot about the, the Danvers Cares programs as well that have been happening. Um, I think it went through those, so. CPAC. No CPAC meeting. There wasn't a CPAC no meeting. meeting. No nope. meetings, okay. Uh, Danvers Human Rights and Inclusion. We talked about MLK. We talked about the uh, the elementary curriculum presentation, which kind of folk, you know, fell under that. I'm looking forward to tomorrow night. Uh, budget, Mr. Taverna. Um, your monthly budget report is attached, and then we also have a January transfers report. Um, this is kind of the second time we always do one in October and then one in January as we prepare the FY23 budget. Okay, any questions for Keith on the budget? All right, none, and uh, personnel? Your monthly personnel report is attached. Okay. Uh, no real highlights this month. Okay. I would like to highlight that for our February meeting, it will also be our budget hearing at our February ah, school committee okay. meeting. So just okay. a reminder to the committee and that will be distributed sometime about a week before, somewhere between a week and five days. Mary and I have, have been joking with Mary, it goes to print on the 7th, it goes to print on the 7th, so that it's ready for the 14th. But by like Wednesday of that week, you'll have it. And if anybody obviously would like to meet prior, um, Mary or I or both of us would be happy to meet with you. All right, thank you. Um, I believe that's all we have on our agenda. So our next meeting is Valentine's Day evening, the 14th. As Keith says, that'll be our... So There's nothing more romantic than a budget presentation. <laughs> really? Yeah. yeah. I, uh, and it's yeah, an executive yeah, session he's done before, <laughs> so it's just. <laughs> you know me, Eric. I certainly can't come on Valentine's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You're romantic at heart, I know. Um, uh, so uh, with that, I don't think we have any, any other interim meetings. I don't think we have a date for either the selectman or FinCo on budget yet, or do we? No, we do not have dates for that, but the February 1st, next Tuesday, mm -hmm. is the financial summit so ah. for the town with the select board and the finance committee um, in the Toomey Room at Town Hall. That's at Town Hall? Okay. Excellent. That's, a, I, that's usually a good evening to attend for a new member, it's, uh, if you can, for the select uh, financial summit because uh, uh, town managers and, and his staff really present a real snapshot of what our finances look like, some projections for the future, and uh, it's an eye-opener, very educational. So I would encourage you to attend if you can. And uh, beyond that, I guess, we'll accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. We have a motion, we have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Good night and thank you, Danvers.